Right. Um, welcome, everyone. Welcome to the final session of this year's Different Strokes Virtual Conference 2020. Well, who would have thought I'd been saying that at the beginning of the year? Um, but anyway, um, just a couple of housekeeping things, really, to start off with. Um, I'm assuming everyone can hear me. If someone, anyone in the chat function can just stick in a yes, that would be brilliant. Got it. Thank you, Neil. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you. Oh, oh, oh they're all... <laughs> I should have nominated one. Should have nominated one person. Um, so that's great. Um, okay. So just a, a couple of things at this, before we start. Um, in order to use the chat function, it, you need to move your mouse to the bottom of the screen and hover over the the chat fun, uh, chat button. And on the right hand side or somewhere on your screen should appear um, your chat screen. That where you can you can utilize that if you wanted to send us information or ask any questions. There's also a Q&A option as well, which is uh, similarly found at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So again, welcome to today's final session. Um, I really hope you've enjoyed this week's um, slightly adapted uh, Different Strokes Conference. As Austin mentioned at the beginning of the week, um, we were aiming to run three conferences um, around um, the country in North, South and a Above the Border Conference. Um, but obviously with the, the pandemic and with things changing, we had to quickly adapt um, our, our conference and we decided to run a virtual conference. So um, I hope that you've enjoyed it. I hope it's been something that you will, you will have got something from. Um, I'm not sure how long things are going to continue in this vein. Um, it seems that um, measures for lockdown or localized lockdowns are, seem to be getting worse with the increased number of infections. Um, but what different strokes did earlier on this year is we adapted a lot of our services, our physical services, to move them online. Um, so, for example, um, we we did we did online exercise classes. Um, online Tai Chi. Um, and another thing that came up as a, as a big request was um, well-being as well. So we'll talk a little bit about that later on as well. Um, I hope that those classes were really useful. The feedback that I've got in some of the networking sessions that we've had this week is that they were really, really good for people, especially because a lot of the people who were um, who had had strokes were self-isolating and had other conditions as well. Um, I should, I guess, tell you who I am. Um, my name is Ranj, Ranj Palmer. I'm a, um, a stroke survivor myself. I had my stroke in 2009. Um, and since then, um, I, uh, we, sorry, started to run a group in Southampton. Um, so we, we um, affiliated ourselves with, with different strokes. And we are now part of, we are now, we now successfully run a, a, uh, a fairly large group in Southampton for stroke survivors, for carers, for family members. Um, since becoming a, um, a group coordinator, I was asked to um, interview to become a trustee, which I thought at the time was a, was a good idea because, um, well, I didn't know what it was, to be honest. Um, so I just went along for the interview, had a chat, and um, they decided to make me a trustee. Um, and then since then, I became vice chair and then chair. Um, the, the really cool thing about being a trustee and being a, a chair of the charity is that we can directly influence exactly what we do. So Austin and, and the team um, do a fantastic job um, and we can we work very closely with 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 the staff. So the board who I'm referring to work very closely with the staff um, and um, help shape the direction the different strokes takes. And that was pretty important this year when we had to adapt a lot of our services, as I've already mentioned. And something that I just want to pick up on uh, something from this morning's talk where Lauren and Joe were talking about um, a strategy for, for the coming year. So again, we're looking to have a host a, a, a Zoom session where we'll all get together. That will be all of the board and all of the, all of the staff um, where we'll uh, where we'll thrash out what we believe is um, the the important parts of the strategy to come for the following year. Um, and it's really important that um, you guys help us do that as well, because ultimately we're here for you. We're here to provide a service for you. So for all of the stroke survivors, all the family members and carers. 
Um, so please feel free if there's some, if there's something that you feel like we're not doing or that you think that we should be doing slightly differently, please feel free to contact us at the info at differentstrokes.co.uk um, and, con and, and just relate to us exactly what you think we should be doing differently. So um, moving on to this final session. So this final session um, is um, our panel of experts and we are really, really fortunate to have um, a great panel here today to talk about stroke and to talk about rehab and to talk about recovery um, and to help everyone through that. So I'd like to kick off by introducing people from the panel. Um, so I'll start with Dr. Giles Yates. Dr. Giles Yates is a consultant clinical neuropsychologist. Giles, do you want to come off mute and just sort of give a, a couple of sentences about you and what you've done? Hello, everyone. Thanks, friends. Um, yes, hi. So I, I, I'm a, a clinical neuropsychologist and I've worked with stroke survivors and survivors of other forms of brain injury for the last 20 years, uh, mainly in the NHS. Uh, and now I'm kind of collaborating with different third sector organisations, including different strokes to uh, um, develop some more nationwide initiatives. Uh, my particular interests are supporting emotional well-being in survivors and their relationships, um, couples relationships, family relationships, supporting sexuality. Um, I'm also a Tai Chi instructor, so I've joined both um, those hats in providing with my colleague Alison Smith the online Tai Chi service that you refer to, Rich. So it's an honour to be here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Giles. And um, one thing I just want to pick up on what Giles said is that collaboration thing. So without the, the collaborations that we have today with the likes of Giles and Physiofunction and the other organisations as well, we would find it very difficult to be able to deliver any sort of support services online or physically, actually. Um, so we're really, really grateful for your, for your support and your input, Giles. Um, moving on, I'm going to move to Claire Everett. Claire is the clinical operations manager and a senior neurophysiotherapist for physiofunction. Claire? Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for inviting me along this afternoon. Yes, I've been a physiotherapist for 20 years or so now, which <laughs> seems incredible, and um, worked in stroke and with physiofunction for the last 10 years um, with John Graham, who many of you will, will know from his involvement with different strokes. So yeah, my, my real passion is working with stroke survivors and looking at different ways that we can help all stroke survivors in their rehabilitation journey. And we like to think of ourselves as um, being great innovators here and looking at the whole person and finding new and exciting ways to um, help rehabilitation and, and making sort of life goals achievable. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Claire. Thank you so much. Um, moving on, um, I'd like to introduce Melanie Derbyshire. Melanie leads the National Aphasia Programme at the Stroke Association in her role as Assistant Director of, of Aphasia. Uh, Melanie? Hello, thank you very much for inviting me to join your panel. That's uh, very pleased to be here. So I've been working with and supporting people with aphasia and their families for more than 17 years. Um, I was chief executive at the National Aphasia Charity Speakability. And um, when the charity merged with the Stroke Association, I moved across. My particular interest is empowering people to take up the benefits of the self-help approach and the self-help model of groups was very much that that we ran at speakability so i'll be pleased to tell you more about um, recovery from aphasia and how you can help yourselves brilliant thank you very much melanie um, and last and by no means least um, we have satinda sangera and satinda I mentioned the, the board of trustees earlier on. So Satinda is one of our merry band of uh, ladies and gentlemen um, and had a stroke 20 years ago herself um, and has worked as a GP and health and the healthcare commissioner for the last 25 years and is, 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 and is about to start a new venture as well. Satinda? Sorry, Ranj, I missed that last bit. Um, you went a bit muted. Um, Hi, um, everyone. Really great to be here. Um, some of you will already recognise me from the health and wellbeing talks that I've been giving. Um, 
Unfortunately, the stroke was actually 34 years ago. Thanks for making me younger. <laughs> so um, I'm, I um, had my stroke 34 years ago at the age of 20 as a second year medical student. And I qualified as a doctor 30 years ago. So um, I'm sort of been in the NHS for rather a long time. And in that time, I've spent over 20 years as a GP partner. I've spent sort of quite a few years as, as a clinical commissioner. And, uh, all... I think you're, um, I think is everyone seeing that Satinda's, um, I... yeah actually recently okay so i'm returning to general actually a few years out I hello yeah we can we we struggled a little bit through that um so I, I think it's just your link that the, we lost a bit of the video and then we lost some sound um okay. all right sorry about it's, that. That's that. That's fine. Um, yeah. So um, you had your stroke thirty. So Tinder had a stroke thirty-four years ago at the age of twenty. So apologies, um, and is recently um, going back into GP, into a GP role, and is retraining to go back into that. Um, so without further ado, let's. Uh, we've got some questions that have been sent in by um, some of the attendees um, when they initially registered for this session. So that's really, really cool. So we can start off with those. If there are any other questions that anyone has or any comments people want to make, please feel free to use the chat and the Q&A function, Q functions uh, within Zoom. So the first question I've got is, how can we improve post-acute rehabilitation? Um, I'm going to start with Satinda for that one, if that's okay. Hi, I hope the connection bears up this time. It's uh, because I live in the middle of nowhere. So sorry about that, guys. Yeah, so basically there's a number of ways that we can improve it. And it certainly does need improving. Uh, I mean, I, I took a straw poll from uh, the clients that attend my, the, the, my gardening uh, health and wellbeing charity. And the majority of those have had strokes themselves and over 75% of them had not had a complete program of post-stroke rehab. In fact, a lot, particularly amongst the younger folk, um, they, none of them had been offered it. And it may be partly because they had unusual strokes and there was a lot of focus on investigating the cause and not actually, you know, doing the important rehabilitation side of things. So uh, we had a, a, a chat about this in different strokes before COVID, where I'd suggested that we we do targeted flyers to stroke rehab units because one thing that comes to my attention from my liaisons as a GP over the years was that um, the uh, stroke rehab services have relied heavily on or charitable organisations like Stroke Association to provide a community support to, to stroke survivors and this unfortunately has been um, pared down in recent times possibly because of issues with funding uh, from some of these charities. So I thought this would be a good opportunity for us to, to step in and say, hey, we're here. Because as you all know, um, different strokes and organizations like ours can help both with the, um, the, the psychology, but also the practical aspects of stroke rehab, but also in terms of signposting as well. But that's only a very small aspect of what's needed because obviously you need the support when you've had your stroke and you're in hospital. Um, there's actually going to be um, a stroke rehabilitation consultation by NICE, which is the National Institute of Clinical Excellence. And that's being held on Monday. And I will be participating in that. Um, and hopefully um, the only problem with these big sort of nice panels is that the the, and I've sat on them as a doctor, is that they often tend to be led by the clinical experts. And sometimes those in the third sector and the, the patient groups, they're, they get a little bit lost. So um, I, I promise I'll work really hard so that our voice is heard. And, um, and of course, the other thing that we do in different strokes is, is lobbying. And, and when we can, we, we go to Parliament and elsewhere. And it's all about just raising the profile of stroke and separating it from 
from heart attacks. You know, trying to make sure that stroke is seen in its own right and not lumped in with the cardiovascular diseases, which unfortunately it still continues to be, happen. And unfortunately, MI heart attacks still seem to get preferential treatment. And so it's still a way to go. But you know, rest assured that Different Strokes is working really hard, as are other organisations. And it's encouraging that NICE is also looking to review its policy on stroke rehabilitation. So they obviously realise there's a need as well. Do you know how um, the whole kind of COVID, I mean, I'm aware in, of, of situations where people have had strokes in the last six months um, locally to where I am. And um, the, because a lot of the, the, the staff, the medical staff were um, retrained and focused on COVID and refocused on COVID, um, a lot of the therapy that they would have received in hospital, they didn't receive. So it was very much a case of trying to get the, the patients out as quickly as possible. Do you know whether, do you know anything about that? Can you talk to that? Because one thing we've done in Southampton is that we've, we've obviously been alerted to this and we've spoke, we're speaking with a local trust and um, trying to ascertain how those people are then are going to be picked up because they'll still need that rehab and, 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 and therapy. And whether it's two, three, four weeks, once on this, they, they will still be able to benefit from that. But can you talk to that at all, Satinda? I have very limited um, information to offer other than I know that it's very much on a trust by trust basis and it varies greatly. So from one hospital to another, even within a region, um, there will be physio services that are doing direct hands on contact wearing PPE and there'll be another hospital down the road where it's all done virtually well obviously after a stroke it can't be done virtually it has to be done you know hands-on and it very much seems to be a postcode lottery unfortunately um at the beginning of the pandemic and in the early stages there was a lot of uh, there was a lot of uh, noise around encouraging people who had strokes to come forward and there was a lot of reassurance that you know you will be seen in a covid free zone that there are you know, the stroke units are being kept separately and that they are COVID free. But whether that message didn't get through or whether it wasn't really believed or whether people had heard other stories, uh, the fact is that there have been less people presenting uh, with strokes. And, you know, unfortunately, you know, there must be a, a reason for that. And I suspect that's not going to be a positive reason. And of course, the other thing to bear in mind, I know myself from our own clients, who have had strokes who usually would uh, come to our charity in the summer a lot of them are very very worried about catching COVID and they would rather have the risk of delaying treatments not seeing the doctor for other associated symptoms than the fear of COVID itself and I think sometimes that fear is misplaced uh, but it's you know whether the media hasn't helped with this I'm not sure but I think, unfortunately, this is not helping the situation, that the fear of hospitals and what they might contain is, is preventing sometimes people who have had strokes from using services that may be available to them. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I agree. Um, Claire, can I, can I pass that on to you next? Is, have you got any comments to make about the, what, what, what we can do to improve that post-acute rehab? Yes, yeah, thank you. Yes, I mean, it's interesting... Um, what we're saying and it is often a, a bit of a lottery where you live in the country and I know locally to us even uh, we we sort of uh, have a lot of clients from different areas that um, it changes quite quite a lot um, I mean I think one of the one of the things that we've been working on it's interesting what Satinda was saying about the the hands-on is the the tele rehab that we were sort of um, thrown into really when uh, the covid crisis sort of first hit and now i i think that that has got such an important role to play in moving forward and into the post covid times um in terms of the way that we can access or we can help people access therapy we've um worked with our local different strokes group and we used to go out and provide a once a month um exercise session and we're now doing those more frequently with small numbers and so 
it's a it's a different way of approaching the rehabilitation um, but a really effective way so it is very difficult because sometimes um, in terms of physical recovery we really do want hands-on and also the emotional recovery that face-to-face is so important um, but I think looking at how we can improve things not only in COVID times but ongoing I think we the the use of uh, technology can, re- can really help us deliver a broad range of services um, to lots of people um, at, at different times when maybe it is difficult to get in the car to go for an appointment or getting a neighbour to bring you to an appointment or it's, you know, when it's you know, very remote. So I, I do think we can use those to help improve our services and access lots of people's homes, um, obviously reliant on having good internet connection and um, and that's, I know, something that is is very much um, ongoing at a government level, isn't it? Trying to improve the uh, internet connection. The other thoughts I had were that um, post-acute rehab is such a big thing. Um, you know, different people, stroke recovery of, goes at different rates. And at different times, people have such different needs or are able to cope with different amounts of therapy and input and quite often a lot gets thrown at people at the beginning which is it's good and gets people home um, and then it, it seems to just drop away um, and then sometimes people are sort of left feeling they've had their they've had their dose and, and that's it so it's trying to work in, with different strokes and other groups on educating people that recovery is ongoing. It's, it doesn't stop after six months or a year or this, this figure that gets, gets thrown around. It is ongoing and it is possible to make those changes for a long, a long time post-stroke. And we, we all see that within our work. And I think that educational part is really important that people feel that they can go and make recovery and they feel empowered to do so and they have uh, resources to help them. And that's what's so important about the work Different Strokes does is helping people find find that uh, resource and help them to empower themselves to, to work on their recovery. Thank you for that, Claire. That's really, really good. Yeah, and, and I think that one of the things that you mentioned there is, is about the whole kind of technological piece and that the fact that not all appointments have to be done physically uh, face-to-face and, and there are lots of advantages to uh, to doing telephone or video type appointments. It's just making sure we get that balance right and making sure yeah. we hit the mark right. And I mean, I think... sorry, just to add in, we've actually had some clients who have been able to access more therapy via tele rehab than, than coming into clinic which was sort of you know so difficult for them to come in on a regular basis they've actually really gained in in the the lockdown period um not only in physical recovery but um one of our clients with speech therapy having a regular slot 20 minutes three or four times a week has really boosted their their recovery so yes it's it's a, it's a, certainly a, a interesting thing to look at Thank you. Thanks, Claire. Um, Melanie? Well, I think um, the, the way I look at things is that organisations and charities that are supporting people who've had a stroke have, um, have an opportunity. And certainly, I know the Stroke Association is very keen to hold people to account, to hold the um, NHS England and to hold um, the boards, the health boards in Northern Ireland, Wales, Scotland, um, because they all run slightly differently, they all have a different um, way of working. But to hold them to account and to actually help them to understand the full pathway of stroke recovery. So it's not just a focus on acute services, but it's also recognising the long term needs for people who've had a stroke. And I think that we are making we are making ground in that and that part of our lobby and campaigning has been very much surveying people after the initial start of COVID and finding out what services have been withdrawn or how people have been limited in access to the care and rehabilitation that they should be receiving. So all of that work is ongoing and I know that I think there's a report if it's not on our website now it will be coming soon. But I think there's another part to that also 
And that's the part that members of different strokes and people who are parts of the groups at the Stroke Association and any other charities working out there. Um, it's through your experiences and your case studies and by you yourselves helping us with that case so that we can effectively lobby and campaign. I think it's really important that people look at how they can influence things and don't feel that they can't have a voice in this. I think there are lots of um, difficulties for people with aphasia and communication difficulties in accessing um, internet services and things online. And so that isn't always the best way for them. But I do think that it's really good that charities like Different Strokes, the Stroke Association, Say Aphasia, other charities are out there actually providing the tools and the, the resources like the videos and things to help people continue to have rehabilitation at home. Because that is really important that people don't just wait for someone else to offer it to them, but they also look at the opportunities that they can take up. And all of us can do something to help ourselves recover. So I think it's a it's a day to day thing, and we all need to be on top of it. I think I think you're absolutely right there. I think and there's a lot there's been a lot of talk in the last um, I don't know a few years or so, whatever, even even longer than that, about self management and self management and rehab and recovery. And uh, initially, people get quite concerned and quite afraid of that 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 um, that sentence, that comment. Uh, but it, if you look at it properly and you and you understand exactly what it means um it, it, it can be really powerful because there are like you say melon there's so much there's a lot of resource out there that people can make use of um and i guess it's really kind of finding a place where um we can maybe put all that stuff into into one place or a library or something like that an online library um but yeah that's a, maybe a challenge for another day uh, giles can i invite you to talk please Thank you, Renj. Yeah, I have really strong feelings about this question, um, particularly as a psychologist. Um, research shows that um, certain psychological and social needs only become apparent and grow, not diminish, grow, get worse in years two to five post-stroke. So particularly the emotional distress of the survivor and their significant others and the breakdown of relationships. So if you think about two years after a stroke to five years, you know, the, the early supported discharge model of an over-medicalized stroke pathway is done and busted by them. And no one's around when those difficulties actually become evident and grow in, 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 in magnitude. So it's an absolute failure of an over-medicalized approach to a stroke pathway. And in my, my experience of working in community services where I support stroke survivors alongside other forms of brain injury, there's a real discrepancy between services say, with traumatic brain injury that can be more organized around um, the longer term enduring consequences of that form of brain injury in comparison to stroke services. As you say, stroke is um, viewed in different conceptual lenses in different ways. Uh, linked to other conditions and I think in, in the way it's viewed in the, in, in the current trends the, the enduring nature of psychological cognitive uh, relationship difficulties are not just seen as part of part of the reality of stroke and so services aren't organized and when when the involvement of a community service is um, considered it's done in a it's in, a, in an underdeveloped way uh, as an art support and as been mentioned here about sufficient funding so where we have an opening of need the funding diminishes in a in this inverse and i think quite per perverse relationship uh, um, breaking that down again you know um that need to be developed further i think we, we um focus a lot on independence of the stroke survivor which is important but what about interdependence? What about interdependence, the relationships between survivors and others and supporting those relationships, be it couples relationships, family relationships, community relationships, which in turn, if you're supporting those, that's going to come back on the 
the psychological well-being of the survivors themselves. So focus on on that kind of social level, that relationship level is important. Um, there needs to be some investment in vocational rehabilitation, support of stroke survivors to think about returning to um, a meaningful um, work or occupational role, be that, be that paid or voluntary. And that's a long-term process. So, you know, if we put these things together, the, the, the complexity of the long game grows where the, the current trend in service Stroke service models um, is diminishing, so I think that's a, we need a complete paradigm shift. Wow, wow, that's um, that's really interesting because that's this almost like an inverse relationship, isn't it? So you've got kind of where you want the support and where you need the support, and the specific type of support for, like, like you say, for emotional distress, for relationship, interdependence, two to five years on, that's just not there. It, it, a lot of the, the a lot of the support is kind of offered um where it's offered at various uh, very very early stages um um and and i guess from experience i think i guess it makes a lot of sense because a lot of people aren't really really to talk about um the things that how their lives have really been impacted until the things have settled down once they've got home and once they've got back into the swing of things whether it's whether it is work or whether it is relationship or whatever so that does make a lot of sense actually so thank you for that Giles that's that's really quite cool there's a couple of um there's a comment I'd just like to um relay from um someone on on the the chat which is as an OT based in ESD that was working on the ward during the first wave we continued as usual with PPE on the ward and in ESD with mixed virtual sessions where possible and face-to-face -face sessions where necessary our service continued essentially as previously considered considering the amount of therapy time people would usually get this person is quite surprised and saddened here that some stroke survivors weren't getting that and it is it's very sad and i'm i'm, I'm it's really cool that wherever you were this uh, this person um that those services were continuing but i guess it, it comes back to what satinda was saying earlier as well it's, it's that national lottery it's that uh, localized lottery type of thing isn't it where wherever you are the service is very can vary so much within five or ten miles down the road um and then we've got a a question as well um in education we worked hard at what was learned what was termed early intervention dealing with issues that presented at nursery and p1 so that the problem didn't always continue into later school it also saved money later why can't we approach rehab in the same way for the best outcomes for survivors and save enormously on care packages later i can i invite who wants to take that first of all I am happy to comment yep. on that. Yeah, I mean, I think on one level, I, I agree with that, that more services in at the beginning will help people, um, will help unpick some of the problems, understand what some of the problems are and provide intensive therapy of, of whatever uh, is needed. But then also sort of looking at the comments Giles made, sometimes things just take a little bit of time to unpack and process and what was important when you were on the ward may not be the new priority when you were at home. Um, so it, it's a very difficult, um, unfortunately, we, we can't just fix everything. If we, if we throw everything at it in the first 12 months, we're not going to end up fixing everybody. Um, but intense therapy at every stage is really what we want, I guess. That's the, uh, the dream. But I think it really does have to be tailored to what the person and the family and and their and the, the the team around you can can manage because it I, from my experience working with various clients over the years it it depends things change sometimes people just can't cope and they need a break they need to go away and not feel guilty because they're not doing their exercises or they're not doing this or they're not doing that or you've not improved so you're discharged but allowed to find themselves a bit and then come back so it's a it is a it's a different there's no the, the best answer in my opinion is, is therapy at all, all stages but tailored to the to the person's individual needs which is a real uh, a real challenge yeah i i completely agree it is difficult to get it right and like i guess 
the the best situation is is that continued therapy as and when you need it all the way through you know whether it's six months a year two years five years and then you kind of dip into the different pots as and when you you're ready to to receive that therapy because as we all know therapy is great but if a person's not ready for it and not ready to receive it it's it's not going to work and it's not going to not going to achieve the the desired outcomes um we've got another question we're only on question one. It's now 20 to three. <laughs> Looks like we might be running into 2021 with this conference. But anyway, let's, uh, let's, let's go to the next question. Um, what would you say is the most important advice you can give to a stroke survivor and their families from your specific area of expertise and experience? I'll go to Melanie for that one first. Okay, well, I think we have to remember that we're all individuals. It's really important to understand that one size doesn't fit everyone. And as Claire was saying just then, that the, the idea is I, ideally people would come in and out of services as they need them, rather than only being allowed to go and have something for six weeks and then not to see people again. But I think the main thing is to understand that it is a long-term recovery and that that is what it is and be honest about that with yourselves and your family and understand that support is going to be needed for all of you because everybody goes on that journey uh, sorry to call it a journey but it is a journey in a way um, recovery is not overnight for most people and it can continue for many many years so in the case of people with aphasia I've seen people actually recover over the years, 25 years on, I've seen people still recovering. To some extent, I believe everyone will recover in some way every day. Very small steps, very small changes, but I do believe that that's possible. And I think that what we do and our attitude to that recovery can influence it hugely. So I obviously advocate for the self-help approach and for continuing those social networks that Giles was talking about, making sure that you're talking to other people who've had that experience and learning and getting hints and tips and strategies to help you along that long-term journey. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, I think that it's a marathon, not a sprint. Um, you know, it's key. For, it's a key message. So, Giles, can I invite you to? What do you think? Your if if you had to kind of give a, a uh, an important piece of advice? Um, yeah, I'd really echo what Melanie said. I think it's it's the long game, and that long game has twists and turns. So, it's important to regroup and update and um, reach out maybe to different people, different resources, different professionals as different needs present themselves so it's more like a meandering river and you're suddenly in new territory and new things come up and 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 the advice and the perspectives that you had earlier on are, are now redundant or not as relevant and you need a different perspective and that's a really difficult process so it kind of goes back also to not doing this alone feeling part of an interconnected web of services professionals bringing new people in as and when it's needed Thank you, Giles. Thank you. Um, and Satinda? Sorry, I'm just unmuting. Um, I think I'm not going to talk as a GP. I'm going to talk as a, as a stroke survivor of 34 years. Um, the first thing is to accept change. When I had my stroke, I was at the top of my game. You know, I, I was a county middle distance runner. I played a lot of team sports. You know, I had lots of aspirations and dreams. So the first thing is to adapt, to accept that things have changed. But, you know, things change for all of us for lots of different reasons in our lives. I mean, I've had lots of other things that I've had to adapt to over the years, as will most, probably all of you. Um, and some of them will be equally as hard as, as the strokes you've experienced. Remember that you're still free, you know, if you're not socially mentally oppressed if you're not sort of if you haven't had your liberties your freedom taken away from you then you are still the master or the mistress of your own life and your own destiny you know you haven't changed the core of who you are hasn't changed people may 
want and think that you've changed. I know I had plenty of that all through my life, you know, people deciding that you're no longer this, you're no longer that. But keep pulling yourself back to the core of who you are, because the core of who you are, you know, you put so much effort into being you over whether it's, you know, a few years, decades, however old you are, you put, you invested a lot of your heart and soul into your, your very being, you know, don't throw all that away because physically now you can't do some of the things you used to do, you know, just drag those disabled back bits of you along with you and keep thinking big, keep dreaming, keep having your aspirations, but accept that you might not be able to reach those same mountain tops. You may have to modify the mountains that you climb in your life. But for God's sake, do not like set your principles, your 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 dreams, your aspirations any lower because you don't really have to. You know, it I not just from personal experience, I mean I I'm what you class as being very disabled from my my stroke in terms of the 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 effect it had on me but i also know from um patients of mine who who are in like electric wheelchairs where they can barely move their arms or their legs and their speech is limited you know the people who've done best with their challenges in life have had the right mental attitude and they have also importantly surrounded themselves by the right kind of people. If you think that you are, you know, if you think that the people around you are a bit like I used to call them kryptonite, you know, like Superman's kryptonite, they just suck all your energy out of you, then move yourself away from them. You know, try and get yourself around more positively minded people. Because if if you're around positive people, then you will become more positive and also you know, you want to keep the people who who look at you and the core of who you are. You don't look at your disability and your stroke. We're all going to get those. You're always going to get people who look you up and down and say, oh, look at that person. They're, they're, they're different or who try and sort of other you or make you feel like you're different. But you can be in charge of, of how much of that you, you allow in, you know, and for all those people who bring you down and unfortunately you will experience a lot of that because life has changed immensely whether it's through your interactions in work interactions in your family wherever you know things will have changed but there will also be people who will admire you for how you have overcome such a difficult immensely difficult challenge those are the people you want to you know you want to tune them people in and you want to tune the other people out, you know, um, and that would be my advice. Thank you, Sajinda. Thanks for that. Thanks for that. Um, Claire, did you get to the answer that question? I can't remember whether you do because... No, I mean, gosh, after that, those uh, three answers, I'm not <laughs> sure what I can add. Um, great advice. I agree, really. I think we're all saying the same things. It, it's having to accept where you are and then and build moving on with the support of those that are going to to help around you and one of the things i always try and find with the people i'm working with is trying to find something that's that's fun that's enjoyable that's the reason there's got to be a reason that we're doing the therapy it's got to be for a purpose not just because i, I should be doing it you know i've been told i should do it it's got to be it, it's got to be uh sort of focused and purposeful and meaningful to you so it's just trying to to find those find those things and work towards them and and as they've all said you know we have we have a meandering path on our rehabilitation journey but take a look at all those things that you see along the path because you you know they they may not have been what you thought you'd see and they might be something that you're drawn to so it's uh it's a it's a a, a, a different journey than maybe the one you planned but it's trying to keep focused and and keeping in mind that yes you are still that person in there and we're, we're all sort of with you on your journey yeah no totally agree totally agree that's um that's um yeah i think it's um i think it's very difficult i think the only comment i'd like to add to this is the fact that um it is a journey i do like melanie i don't really like that word um and you are going to be meandering here there and everywhere like giles has said so um but I think it's also, I think it's important to kind of make sure you, you um, look at what you're doing as well. So you keep a diary or something. This is a very uh, practical kind of uh, answer, but keep a diary of what you've, what you've done so that you know that you have made progress because before you know it, you'll get into a rut where you think I'm not, I'm not getting anywhere anymore. 
and I'm kind of like, it's, it's very, very small, um, the progress from day to day, but at least you're making progress. And that's the most important thing. And um, the number of times I've had to have had to, uh, an argument with a, a clinical person about the fact that, you know, um, you need to stop telling people that they're not going to recover six months later after their stroke. You know, if I had a, if I had a pound for every time, you know, I'd be a millionaire easily. Um, so I've, I've had stand up disagreements with, with clinical physicians saying, you know, you need to stop doing that because every time you say those words, you're destroying someone's, um, you know, capability, ability, their mental attitude, you're just taking them down where you don't really, you don't, you can't hand on heart say that that's definitely going to be the case. So unless you can't, then just, then don't say it because the, the gravity of what you're saying is, you know, is, is, is huge. Um, but thank you very much. We've had a, another comment. I'm just going to read that out from saying someone's also an OT working in ESD and community stroke and agree with the, the, the comment from before saying that they did lots of stuff through the pandemic face to face and via video telephone and also very surprised that some other, uh, other areas didn't do this. Um, and then, um, and another comment saying that Claire, you explained that very well. So <laughs> well done for you. So I'm going to move on to the next question. We're only on question two, it's two fifty. Um, maybe we can start to keep the answers a little bit shorter. Um, so the second question that we've got um, that we were sent in, in advance was what external resources and organizations are there to assist with physical recovery? Um, why don't we start with Claire with that actually? <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so, um, I mean, my my sort of first thoughts here were we've obviously got the the local groups, the the different strokes groups, um, and obviously, but then clearly, there's not one in every every town, unfortunately, across the the UK. But again, going back to what we we're saying before, we've got the the tele rehab side of things with different strokes and using the interactive forums. Um, and I know that we've been involved with the online exercise sessions. Um, that will go out at 11 o'clock every morning. So although they're sort of, they're low, there are local groups, you are always local to a group because you can have it in your, in your front room. So, so that's, um, that's a really positive thing. Obviously, there are lots of different charities and organisations, and um, as Melanie's mentioned her, her work as well. We, there are private therapies that you can, um, you can tap into. And again, that can be on your doorstep or it could be remotely again. Um, and it's also looking at sort of other, other work, uh, for example, with um, the Arnie group as well. So there are lots of different things out there, lots of local gyms that have sessions that are set up for those people who need more assistance and lots of local gyms that are more than willing to, to help if, if you go in there. I know I've been with some clients I've worked with and the, the instructors at the gyms have been fantastic and they've people will go out of their way to help you access their their services even if you know in private gyms or in in local council run gyms so there are things out there i guess it's always a challenge it's hard when you don't know where to look it's hard to find things when you know where to look you can find all sorts of things so i guess that's where we come back to different strokes being a a good focal point for and a resource really for for folk thank you very much claire thank you um, melanie um, if we can try and keep the answers a little bit short, that'd be great. Yeah, I mean, the different strokes videos are great. Um, I'm not very energetic myself, but I can see the, <laughs> the value on them. And if you haven't had a look, I recommend you go and have a look. Equally, um, if you check out mystrokeguide.com, that's a stroke association website, and there's some exercises on there with stroke of luck. So there are things out there, and um, hopefully there'll be a sheet after this session, which points you to some of these resources but you know there are things out there and and just going out for a walk or going out in the fresh air can actually help you it keeps you motivated and gets you um exercising as well that's really important and my dog would say please take me out for a walk you're gonna loan him out then <laughs> um giles can i move on to you please um yeah i, I as a tai chi instructor i would a big up for Tai Chi and yoga and the mind body Eastern approaches that are in the community, but just to caution, uh, to bring up many caution around um, accessing resources, be they online or in, physically in the community. 
um, a, a lack of maybe stroke awareness by providers of yoga or tai chi in the community may mean that it's not as easy um, as one would think to access the right teacher or group for you. Hence the uh, online initiatives. Yeah, so we're all going in the right direction, I think. Thank you very much, Charles. And Satinda, anything to add to that? Just really to say that physical re recovery is for life. And, um, you know, whether you're, just, you know, have had stroke or not, you know, we all need to be focusing on our health and well-being. And it is not just, if you want to recover physically, then you, you mustn't forget your mind. You really mustn't because that will be your driver for the physical activities. And also, it's important to do things that you enjoy. I, I, I can't emphasize that enough. For me, the best physical recovery I had was based on taking up activities which I could do with my new body, but which I actually found was a reasonable compensation for what I had to give up. And that was my physio, because I'll be honest, um, you know, I'm, I'm having to have some shoulder physio at the moment, and I find it really boring to the 100 move your arm like this in this direction, 100 in that direction. It, I'll do it for a while, but then you're gonna get bored of it after a while. And so, but you can spend, you know, hours doing something you enjoy and not realize in the process, you're improving your mental health, you're, you're improving your core stability, you're, it's helping your gait patterns, it's helping you to, to get your body moving in the new pattern that it's decided is most comfortable for you. The more you do it, the more the stronger you will become and the more confident you'll be in taking your body to even greater challenges so i would say do things that you enjoy and there are things like um, now that the government realizes that um, there are a number of prescribed activities out there and they are trying to link uh, patients to those through primary care networks networks in the form of something called socially prescribed activities. So hopefully, uh, I know COVID's put a dampener on everything, but hopefully we should be signposted by our uh, named um, practitioners and, and named social prescribers to uh, activities in your area, which also get you back out in the community as well, which is equally important um, to do. Thanks for that, Satinda. I did see uh, Claire wincing a little bit there when you mentioned the do 100 of this and 100 of that. I guess it goes back to the Claire's comment about making it relevant and making it um, fun and making it... Yeah, 100 uh, seems quite hardcore, I think. <laughs> 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 okay, thank you for that, guys. Um, moving on to the third question... Um, what alternative therapies are there for communication, speech therapy, and tiredness? And can I, Melanie, can you take that one? Yeah, running out of time rapidly, aren't we? So I'll keep it brief. But in terms of communication, um, using language and any way you can to communicate if you have aphasia is uh, it's really important and it will encourage the best recovery um, and the rebuilding of the, those neural pathways that we're trying to get working. Um, short periods so you don't get too tired, but do it regularly because it's the repetition that's really important. Join a group if you can, so you can sort of stay active and get support from others who've gone through the same experience. That's really helpful. And use plenty of strategies and tips to support your conversation. So carry a little ID card. I'm sure different strokes have got one, Stroke Association have got one, others have. There's um, resources on the Stroke Association website in the aphasia section. Use a picture chart, have a pad and pen so you can write down keywords or draw. Um, Use your gesture, facial expressions, um, mime, writing, drawing, pointing at pictures, photos. If you're using a smartphone, have photos of where you've been. Wherever you go, take a photo. Then you can show one, someone else and tell them where you've been. Um, there's, there's lots of things you can do to keep your own communication going and encourage other people to talk to you and not just to um, come in and smile at you and walk out, but actually communicate using all those different strategies. In terms of speech therapy, I think it's really important that people understand that 
we are all different and aphasia is different for everyone. So it's, it's really good to have a proper assessment. And if you're interested in doing um, any of the work that comes up on apps, any of the new digital apps to support people with aphasia, knowing which ones are going to be the best ones to support you with your type of aphasia is really important. We've been doing some work at the Stroke Association and it will be up on the website soon, but we've been looking at the top eight aphasia apps and we've user tested them with people with aphasia and we talked to speech and language therapists. So we'll be able to give you some more tips on those, but it's really important not to go out and buy something that isn't right for you. So if you can get that advice, please do. And then just really tiredness for me, having a conversation, communicating is tiring. And so particularly if you're online, like this sort of stuff, um, take plenty of breaks and if you're doing something on a computer or tablet only do it for a short while make sure that you don't just sit there for ages do it for a short while have a break go back to it if you want to give your brain time off I know Giles would agree with this you know get out into nature um, spend some time doodling or doing something else where you're not having to concentrate so hard and uh, and just make sure that you drink plenty of water, keep yourself hydrated so that all those brain cells can work to their best function. Thank you for that, Melanie. Unless anyone's got anything desperate they want to add to that, I'd like to, if possible, move on. I see Satinda, you've unmuted. Would you, did you want to add something to that? Uh, no, you're fine. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, oh, sorry, just... sorry, can I quickly, quickly come in? To, of course. In a nutshell, in a nutshell with communication, um, the emotional safety of the communication setting is important. So a bit like, and, and the right communication partner, to find people where communication naturally flows better with someone who's flexible and responsive. Like a, you can have a good dance partner and a bad dance partner. So, so I think finding the right people to communicate with to support that is, is important. With fatigue, there's some interesting research now that shows that Tai Chi, yoga, and mindfulness um, are having replica replicable um, benefits for the reduction of fatigue across studies. Um, so that's a, a, a important one, thinking about those kind of approaches to managing fatigue as well. That's me done. Thank you for that, Giles. And yes, Satinda? Yeah, actually, um, I did want to say something which was around, um, similar to what Giles was saying about um, on the fatigue front, uh, I think Melanie covered the, the speech and language really, really well. Thanks, Melanie. Um, yes, simple things like breathing. You know, don't forget um, to breathe all the way down to the base of your, your lungs because you, you can have an efficient way of getting oxygen into you, an inefficient way. And you need all the help you can get when you're struggling with day-to-day -day activities at the best of times so you know making sure you concentrate on the basics getting the foundations right with your breathing with as melanie said your, your, your water intake with eating the right foods with getting the right sort of sleep all these things will help to improve those levels of fatigue um, because it is a it is a battle i agree it's a battle for all of us but you can do things that can help yourself in that respect Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, unless Claire, you want to, oh, I'm going to move on to the next question. That, that's fine. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> oh, it's actually for you. Um, so Claire, why is there no physical skeletal assessment after you've had a stroke? Yeah, this is a really interesting question um, because in a way there should be, but you might not feel that there was. And I can completely understand that because when as a neuro specialist we go to assess somebody say in a hospital setting who's had a stroke for example we're, we're very much looking at you as a whole person which i think really echoes what will go on hopefully throughout your rehabilitation journey that we are looking at you as, as a whole so although you may feel they didn't look at your your joints they should have done and i i am sure and confident that you know with the 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 physiotherapists working throughout the NHS, you know, are, are looking at you as a whole. So looking at, at your range of movement um, and how you move as a, as a person. So not only um, 
you know, can you lift your arm this high, but how would you perform in a, in a functional task rather than possibly going right into the, um, the detail of a, of a joint assessment? Because of course that would be a, a huge undertaking to do such detail of every, every joint. What you, you may be alluring to in the question, I, I, I don't know, is just um, trying to sort of think of various different um, aspects. Sometimes people have pain post-stroke and joint pain, and some of this can be because of immobility and, and we all get sort of stiffness in joints. We know ourselves if we don't move too much. Um, and quite commonly people experience uh, shoulder pain post-stroke because essentially the shoulder is sort of held together by the muscles and with the weakness in the muscles, the joint can come somewhat out of place. Um, and at that point, the physiotherapist working with you will be looking at how to address this. And if there is a pain issue, we'll address it in the way that we would address a joint pain in, in, any, in anyone, looking at how we can help relieve the pain and then looking at exercises to help improve the range of movement and the control of movement and the activity in those muscles. Um, so it might be uh, pain, you know, mobilization techniques and then also muscle, uh, muscle work, so exercise, maybe electrical stimulation, taping to help keep the, the joint in place. And at that point, they probably will home in more on, on a more of a skeletal um, assessment. The other thing that um, sort of should be brought up when you're assessed is, have you got any you know, underlying um, orthopedic or skeletal issues? You know, maybe you've had a hip replacement in the past or you've, you've you know, broken your shoulder in the past. So those things all should have been brought up. And if they haven't, it's always relevant to, to bring those up with your physiotherapist. And we should all be looking at sort of working collaboratively. So if I see a, a client who's got a very specific joint problem and I feel it needs um, particular detail, I may then look at referring to a, a musculoskeletal specialist or, or looking at a broader range rather than just writing it all off to being, oh, it's because of your stroke. But let's have a look and investigate it and, and, and see if we can help you sort it. So I believe it probably... It's, it should be done, but it may not be quite as uh, transparent as as look as as will have as you may expect. I hope that that helps and answers the question. If not, I'll have to come back when 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 the question the person posing the question comes back to us. Thank you for that, Claire. Um, if there's, is there, are there any other comments on the panel on on that question? Because I'd like to move on, if possible, to the to the final question, which is quite a. Well, it's a million dollar question. Um, <clears throat> last question we have today um, <clears throat> is, will I ever recover completely from the stroke? Um, Giles, can I start with you? Yeah, yeah, that is a million dollar question, isn't it? And, the, the, and it's such a slippery one as well, because the person who posed that maybe has a, have a vision of what their complete recovery is for them what their life looks like, what they were doing, who they were, the quality of their relationships, their roles, the meanings in their life. And that's going to be different to someone else who's had a similar or different stroke. So no pun intended on the study. So, um, so I think I always try and reverse engineer that question and say, actually, okay, what, what do you want to be returning? And, and, and what, what work needs to go in to support that or what strategies you know we, we've heard about different domains of life haven't we the physical domain the energetic domain the fatigue domain but also maybe it might be returning to a work role it might be um, um, a particular kind of life position or quality of relationship so I think it's 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 taking I I, I can't imagine to know what it's like to be a stroke survivor I can, it makes sense to me that that question is paramount, but it's not easily answered. So I think t reversing it, taking it backward, okay, what, what needs to be done to make um, important aspects of your life accessible to you again? And that begins a whole different set of conversations, I think. Yeah, I think that's, um, I think that's a really good answer because it is it's such a difficult question to answer. Um, what does, what does, getting your life back actually mean to you um, and the acceptance of being um, slightly different going forwards and um, but not necessarily meaning that you're not not being able to live a, a happy and fulfilled life it's, it's just going to be slightly different um, Satinda can I move on to you for that question 
you're still on mute. So there's, there's two elements from this. One is it really depends on where in the uh, brain anatomy you've had your stroke um, and the extent of the damage, also the length of time which has passed from when it came on to when you perhaps get an intervention or not, in my case, because there weren't interventions back then. Um, so that's part of the issue because that then impacts on the prognosis of complete recovery. Um, and then it's absolutely, as Giles said, and he, he said it very, very well, it really does depend on what that looks like for you. So, for example, I knew from pretty early on that uh, when I exhausted all the possibilities that I would ever be able to run again, that I was going to have to reframe my life. And, and I had to then look for other things and decide what else am I prepared to sort of strip away. And then I decided that some of the things I decided I was going to do, I was told absolutely that wasn't going to happen, like returning to medicine and so forth, or riding a bike. So there were some things that I accepted, but mostly the acceptance had to come from me by going through a process of realizing whether that was the truth or not. I didn't accept anything at face value. Uh, forgive me all you remarkable professionals out there. Um, I, I didn't really listen to what I was told by my physios, OTs, neurologists, GPs. <laughs> um, I decided that I was going to decide and then I had to go through that process of realizing that some things were not going to happen and then going through a, a sort of a brief kind of grief process and then sort of quickly moving on and and accepting that change and that redirection and then putting all my efforts and energy into the things I thought were still salvageable and what I will say is that whatever it is that you want to achieve it will require extremely hard work, a lot of dedication, a lot of patience, a lot of discipline. And if you really want to, to get somewhere, you need to bear in mind it will take a lot of effort and a lot of support from the right kind of people around you. And I can't overemphasize that, you know. So have a positive attitude, but bear in mind that everything you set out to to return to may not be achievable. And you know, you need to have that in the back of your mind. You know, don't set yourself up for big falls, you know, work your dandest at it, but ex acceptance that, you know, sometimes you have to go with the flow of life and all its twists and turns and challenges. Because unfortunately, stroke isn't the only thing that you are going to face in life. You know, there will be other challenges as well. And like with everybody, you have to rise to that. And all I know is that the most disabled people I know have been disabled by their attitude to change and to adapting to things that happen to them, not the actual physical disability itself. Thank you for that, Sazinda. Thank you. Um, Melanie? Well, I think it's fair to say that everyone is going to have a different experience. And for me, it's not so much about have I recovered, but have I... Um, have I got a, a quality of life? Am I living my life? And am I getting some satisfaction from that life? Am I fulfilled by that life? So I know a number of people who have got many of their words back and they are more confident about communicating and having conversations. But when they're under pressure, when they feel stressed or they're tired, they may continue to have some difficulties with their aphasia. And it may be not very marked. It might not be as bad as it was five years ago. But nevertheless, there is a residual sense that when they're tired, when they're under pressure, they can have difficulties. Some people don't get all their words back. We obviously want to speak again. I understand that. We want our words back. But for some people, being able to communicate and use all the different types of communication that I was talking about earlier has actually enabled them to have a good sense of their own lives. It's enabled them to have an identity and to express themselves and actually get on with their lives. So I think it's a little bit, as Giles was saying, in a way it depends what we're 
looking at as recovery and what our perception is of that. What I would say is that I believe that we can influence that recovery. And I believe that, as Satinda was saying, it does take hard work. But there are things that we can all do every day in, in any, any long-term condition that can make a difference. And it's more about what you're focusing on and what you're trying to achieve. Take small steps and achieve small goals along the way to those bigger goals. And I think you can say that everyone will have made some level of recovery. And that's what it's all about, really, getting on with your lives. Thank you, Melanie. Very, very wise words. And Claire, can I leave you to comment on that as well, please? Yes, thank you. Yes, some really uh, great advice from everybody there on the on the panel. And it's such a difficult question. And there is, it was, well, risk of sounding like a politician, there is really no answer. Each person is so individual. And I made a few notes sort of prior to the, uh, to the meeting. And um, my sort of final comment on my page is your perception of recovery will change on your rehabilitation journey. And I think that hopefully sort of summarizes what some of what people have said that it, it is ever changing you know when you're when we're in in one position maybe we just want to get home I just want to get home I just want to get out of the hospital and then when you get home you, you've changed again right I want to be able to um, go and see my grandchildren or I want to be able to do this so we're constantly changing our goalposts which is why we constantly change and make recovery and make make differences obviously I'm talking primarily from a physio, a physio point of view there um, in terms of the examples, but we will change. And it is finding, it's finding the joy in the things that you can do and looking to the things that you want to do and trying to work and find those, find the ways that we might get there. So it might be that you, I really want to get to, to this point, but I know I'm going to have to have a bit of help getting there. And I'm going to accept that um, because it will get me to where I want to be or it's just trying to break things down, but keeping a view on the overall picture, but allowing yourself to in, in, try and enjoy the activities that you're doing, because we need that, as Satinda said, otherwise it's just, it's just exercise for exercise sake. It's got to be fun. It's got to add something else in. So on your, your sort of recovery, it's an ongoing process, I suppose, like for all of us in our, in our life journey, it's an ongoing process. We probably never really, do we ever reach that, that point of completion? And, and could we identify it if we did? I don't, I don't know that I could. It's just all the time, just sucking up and enjoying the experiences you've had and learning from them and moving them, them forwards and, and getting as much um, sort of energy and joy from those around you to help take you on that journey. Thank you for that, Claire. Thank you very much. Um, that's the last. That's the last question. There's a couple of so there's there's one other comment that was on the the on the chat, which is someone basically reiterating the the point around. Um, he has a huge respect for the consultant who heads up his local stroke unit, but he still regularly tells survivors that they've made all the progress they can achieve. Indeed, he and his team often tell folks they won't make any any further progress after a year, which is um, oh. Actually, we better move on from that. Um, okay, so that actually concludes our panel discussion. There's no other questions that have come in and no other comments. Um, so just for the panel today, I just want to personally thank you very, very much for taking the time to be with us today to help us um, field all the questions um, and to give some really insightful um uh answers and and kind of stimulate some discussion around that as well now going forward um and I, kind of the way i see this is it kind of it opens up a new conversation for us all um especially some of the stuff around um the fact that in an ideal world you'd have your therapy at every stage at, at every period of week to week month to month year to year so you then kind of decide oh well, you know what now's the right time for me to have this so i'm going to have this for a bit because i really need help with this uh, aspect of my life um and the, the 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 one thing i just wanted to come back to is that comment giles from you about the the whole kind of two to five year emotional distress and interdependence and uh, relationship type, you know, people aren't typically ready to start working on that until a couple of years after they've had their stroke, by which time 
all those stroke services have kind of dwindled away and they're moving on to the people who, who, who they think need them at now, but they, they don't. So it's that kind of shifting, shifting the, the, the thought process and shifting that paradigm over so that people kind of, and ultimately it's about getting the best out of the service and delivering the best service for people at the right time. Um, so that was, that was really powerful. So, um, Thank you very much, everyone. I really, really appreciate it. Um, again, uh, fantastic panel discussion. Um, so that kind of concludes the, the panel discussion for today. I just want to say a couple of other final things because I'm conscious of the fact that we've, it's now 3.20 and this is the, the longer session and I blame Satinda for that. Um, but <laughs> um, this thing we've done this week is really about kind of triggering things um, and triggering thoughts in within people and i i kind of see this as the beginning of of, of what we re need to do together um so it's really a it's really a a wish from me really for for everyone who's attending today to keep in touch to keep that dialogue open um to keep talking to different strokes and to stroke association physio function to giles um and to tinder and the board and, and everyone within within our kind of stroke family if you like um um because we're all here to kind of help each other um and um we can't do it without the panel we can't do it without the stroke survivors we can't do it without all the the family the carers and everyone together together we'll achieve so much it, it, individually we we, we 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 really won't um so you know and i i do want to talk about the the it, the, the different stroke strap line, which is reclaim your life. And that's what it's all about. And that kind of really answers that last question as well a bit, where Giles was talking about reverse engineering the question. Well, yeah, it's about reclaiming what you want from your life. What's important to you? And it, it may be something that you've not done before. Um, so, and it's, it's, it's finding that, uh, that hook and then kind of going with it and running with it and then getting the support you need to, to kind of fulfill yourself. Um, Finally, I just want to say um, thank you, a huge thank you to Austin um, and the, the staff um, who've done a fantastic job this week putting on this, this, um, this conference um, and really kind of making it easy and accessible for everyone. Um, I, found, I particularly found some of the networking sessions really cool, the fatigue session, the, the, all of them really were really well run. Um, and I think they've done a fantastic job to kind of adapt how they were planning to do, run, the, run the conferences this year to how they've actually managed to do that. So my personal thanks to those guys. And also my personal thanks to the board um, for which um, the, uh, we have one member who, who's on our, our panel today, but they do a great job behind the scenes as well. Um, so I guess really just to wrap up is just to sort of say thanks again, everyone. Uh, keep the dialogue open and I very much look forward to seeing you all next year, hopefully physically, if not virtually works now, we know that. Um, so thank you very much for your time and um, look forward to seeing you all soon. Take care.